we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome. So uh, my name is Erica Menchin Trevino, and I'm going to uh, talk to you today about the um, big adjustment I've done to uh, the way that I uh, grade my classes. And um, so I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here so you can see a slide presentation and just do an overview of, of basically what, uh, what we're going to do today. So let me. Nope. Sorry, present. Okay. Okay, I see. Okay. Um, so the goal here is to really talk about the underlying motivations of, of why I went to a, a pass-fail grading system is basically I read a book and I implemented what was in the book. But um, just to go over some of the reasoning for this. So, so the, the plan for today is that I'll just sort of introduce myself and more of the purpose of, of the talk today. Um, I'll talk about the specifications grading, the, the ideas behind that. Um, and how I actually implemented it in my class. Um, we can do questions along the way if you want to um, add them in the chat or whatever. We'll, uh, I can um, take questions that way. Uh, we'll also have some time for Q&A as well. And then at the uh, end, we'll do an activity where we'll actually do um, breakout rooms where you can um, start implementing this with one of your assignments um, if you if you want to do that in the last 25 minutes. So that's basically the plan for this session. So um, just a little intro to myself. I started here at AU in um, 2015. Before that I was in uh, in the Netherlands and before that I uh, got my PhD at Northwestern. Um, so usually I'm teaching social science research methods courses. I do that at the undergrad, master's, and uh, PhD level. Um, I also do like the intro common hundred course sometimes as well. But basically I'm interested in, in research methods as a, a research interest in digital methods as well and sort of political polarization. My quarantine intro is that I'm quarantined with my husband and six-year-old son in, in Chevy Chase, Maryland. So uh, I've been getting it more into cooking and baking and uh, all sorts of fun quarantine activities. But uh, anyway, so um, the idea behind this talk is to consider a really different perspective on grading. Um, it does, uh, important to indicate, fit it does allow you to give A through F grades, right? So each assignment is pass fail. It doesn't make the course pass fail. So um, I'll talk about how that's actually achieved. It's achieved in a different way than giving percentage points um, for grades. It's basically giving different assignments for different grades. Um, so it's really kind of a big picture rethink of what grades are for and how they relate to um, student learning. So um, obviously now, you know, pass fail has been on people's minds because we've sort of switched to pass fail um, right now for uh, as an option for students. This is not really related to that. Um, however, it did make the transition to um, giving students the option pass fail later in the semester much easier because in my syllabus from the very beginning, it specified exactly what you need to do to pass the class, right? So I hope that in the future, we never transition to uh, pass fail mid semester ever again, but, um, but that is a plus of the system if, uh, if that did ever happen again, it is kind of convenient for that. Um, Okay, so maybe you've ever heard students either say this or imply this by their behavior. Um, you know, sometimes students don't do assignments or particular pieces of assignments because it's only a small part of the grade. 
um, or maybe they only need a certain grade to get a, a certain percentage to get the grade that they want, right? So, um, you know, underlying this is, you know, they, they want to know what do they need to do to get a certain grade. Uh, so this is a pretty common kind of thing. And it used to, you know, be somewhat annoying <laughs> when, um, when I would sort of encounter these, these kinds of things. Um, but I don't have that problem anymore. Um, and, and I kind of see these as more reasonable questions uh, given So um, this is obviously much more typical in a required class than in a uh, in an optional class, but you'll still sort of see this, especially this time of the semester. Another thing that I have thought as well is like, okay, if I'm sometimes if I'm giving a B minus or something, like I really wonder um, if the students are learning anything um, in the class. So that's also something that this uh, this system really addresses is that I have a minimum set of standards that are kept to 100%. Uh, so I know that students are achieving particular outcomes if they, uh, if they pass an assignment. So what this system does is that um, it answers these questions for students. What do I need to do to get the grade that I want to get? Um, and it helps you say, okay, I know that they, if they pass this assignment, they did these exact things. Um, so the book is, uh, that I read that sort of the, the, these ideas are based off of is called specifications grading or specs grading for short. Um, people don't know that name, so I didn't put it in the title of the talk. And, and basically it means every assignment is pass fail. Um, this is a really big structural change in a certain way, but at the classroom level, so it's something that anybody can can implement. Um, it is available as an ebook uh, through AU Library, which is great. It's also, of course, a physical book, but um, I found it really inspiring and, and compelling uh, to read. So I'm going to give you sort of a, a few highlights. But basically, if you're interested in implementing these ideas, um, the, the book is really highly recommended and very well written as well. Uh, so the, the title of the book has sort of three main parts, restoring rigor, motivating students, and saving faculty time. I'm gonna focus on the motivating students part primarily. Um, because that's kind of one of the things I found really compelling. Um, and one of the things to think about is, you know, the, the partial credit model is that um, the stakes are very low. Sorry, I spelled very wrong. Um, very low. <laughs> uh, but they, they um, It depends how important the assignment is, whether how high or low the stakes are for the grade. Um, but basically, things that don't meet standards are often um, often accepted. Versus a mastery or competency model. And how I like to think about this is, this system is kind of like the bar exam. Um, there's a high standard for passing the bar but you can take it again, <laughs> right? Um, so the standards are very high, but the stakes are low in that, yes, of course, you would like to pass it in a certain given amount of time, but it's not that failing it is a catastrophic, unrecoverable kind of thing, right? Because a, a, a key to, to using pass-fail is um, giving people the opportunity to try again um, so that they can uh, meet the standards, even if they're high. Uh, so, okay. It also gives students a feeling of control over, over their grades. Uh, okay. So the assumption 
behind all of this is that achieving the learning outcomes of the course is the driving motivation. Um, I know that, you know, not everybody subscribes to that belief, but that's sort of the, the underlying idea uh, behind this kind of approach is that um, all of your course design decisions are based on um, having students achieve your learning outcomes. So if you're writing the learning outcomes, hopefully um, these are things that you want to achieve. But even if you are receiving learning outcomes, um, <clears throat> you can add your own. And that's what I did for uh, the class that I'll be talking about as the example today. So the, the really short version of the ideas from the book is that, um, and, and what basically what you have to do uh, to implement this, this idea is that students have to understand the specs before they do the assignment. Um, exactly what do they need to do to meet the requirements. So um, that is basically means a type of rubric, but also examples, right? Um, so especially for the more important or, or more um, involved assignments, uh, it's really useful to have examples of successful and also unsuccessful assignments um, and to point out to them what's successful and unsuccessful about them. Um, it's also helpful to estimate the time it would take to do the assignment. And that's really um, so they understand the level of work that's expected, not, you know, it, it depends how good you are at guessing these things, how, how, how helpful it is for them in planning, but it gives them an example of um, what is the magnitude of work that's required for this assignment. Um, another important thing is that you really can't change the uh the specifications after they turn in the work um that sounds like an obvious thing but uh sometimes you really want to <laughs> um but uh, you know that would not be fair to do um and something that you have to do with this even as opposed to a multi-level rubric is decide exactly what your minimum acceptable level is right and that goes back to okay, if they do these things, are they going to achieve the learning outcomes, right? So people can set their level at different levels. In the specs grading book, they talk about, you know, um, you could set your level at an A, right? Um, you could set it at an A minus even. Um, I kind of set my level personally as what I regard as a B plus level work, um, but, that differs for different people. So basically you decide what the bar is for, for a pass and design your one level rubric around that. Um, there needs to be some kind of flexibility. So I'll talk about my token system. And to completely implement it for an entire course, um, you have to map the assignments to outcomes and also decide on whether you're going to do a higher hurdles approach for higher grades. So higher grade means, you know, um, achieving the outcome at a higher level, or does it mean that they practice more, more hurdles kind of approach? So when I first implemented this, it was in a graduate uh, class, a graduate research methods class. It had 10 students. Um, so I did that, um, not this semester, but the previous semester. Right now, I'm almost done with uh, two sections, so 40 students total in a research methods class, but for undergrads. So I found that um, it does shift somewhat more work to the planning phase of the course. Um, students seem to really like the, the way that it works and, and gives them more of a sense of security. Um, I was very nervous about this, um, but so far uh, they've been really pretty happy about it. Um, and the thing that I really like about it is that it, I would, I realized that there's a lot of emotional labor involved in grading. Um, and this kind of system really uh, really helps with that. Rubrics in general help with that, but I think these one level rubrics in particular, um, you know, make grading more of a checklist kind of thing 
um, you still get high quality work. I want to say that um, I would say that the quality of the work overall that I get that I get in response to these assignments is far above what I would uh, previously get because they know if they don't do all the things that I ask, they're going to have to do it again. Um, so anyway, so I wanted to move over and show you the uh, syllabus the, and the um, basically the things that were attached to that email. Um, are there any questions at this point before I get into the example? You can either unmute yourself or you could do in the chat. There's nothing from the chat. Um, can you explain the hurdles, please? Yes. Um, so they're assignments, right? So um, sometimes to get a higher grade, you need to complete assignments that are more difficult, that require more mastery and a higher level of, let's say, you know, applying the skill rather than just recalling information. So that's one way to think about how to earn a higher grade through different assignments. Um, and the other way is just that they do more assignments that are similar. So maybe there's, you know, a few core topics and most people have to, to pass the class, you have to do three of the five, but to get an A, maybe you have to do five of the five different topics, but the same assignments or something like that. That's kind of what that means. Um, okay, so let's do the example. So I'm gonna go over to, I'm gonna stop the, this and go over to, okay, so you can see the syllabus at this point, hopefully. Okay. All right, so I just did, I, I included some, you know, information about the class just so that you know what you're looking at here and what the purpose of the class is. I also left in this part about the outcomes because those are so important to the general concept. Um, these first four are the ones that are um, that I developed and then the rest are because this is a, um, a core uh, course that meets a one of the um, uh, Q2 requirements. So the Q2 outcomes are in here as well as my own. But more importantly, all of the assignments are mapped to learning outcomes. So um, I can make sure that even though the students who are aiming for lower grades are um, not doing every single assignment, <clears throat> that they are getting every single learning outcome, right? So that's why that part is important to kind of like, when you're thinking about how to break up um, the assignments and how to do that, that's uh, that mapping of the outcomes onto the assignments is really helpful. Uh, okay, so one of the things that's, uh, that the students really like is the tokens. So basically uh, a token, Everybody gets four tokens. The, the idea is that um, it gives them flexibility to either uh, excuse an absence. This doesn't really apply anymore because I just record the classes in case they can't come. So some of this is not exactly the same anymore, but, um, and it also uh, allows them to rewrite an assignment that they failed, right? And so, um, what it uh, what I chose to do with this is I give them four tokens at the beginning and this and the reason that there's a limited number of tokens is that um, just on the off chance that somebody wants to rewrite the same assignment four times which is not allowed you can only rewrite it once um, but if they are just constantly failing um, it gives them some incentive not to fail everything um, and rewrite it again and again or something like that. I haven't had trouble with that, but it kind of sets parameters on how much stuff you have to regrade, um, even though the regrades are really pretty easy usually. Um, there's a whole special uh, way to deal with tests, um, and I am happy to talk about how to deal with tests in a, in a pass-fail um, system. 
but basically like it allows them to get a one week extension um, on anything. So uh, I've, I've seen a lot of token use for people who um, just need more time. Um, and then also some of them don't, um, you know, have, fail some assignments as well. So, so, so really the, the, the magic <laughs> of this approach is in uh, which assignments are required for which grade. Um, so this is uh, not hard to implement on Blackboard, but it needs to be explained to students that pass is one, fail is zero. It's not that you got one point or something, it's pass, fail. Uh, so it doesn't calculate a grade properly in Blackboard, but they can see what they passed and what they failed. So it still gives them their grade, it just doesn't give them a percentage grade. Um, but yeah, so, you know, for the, I, I really had to think about, okay, exactly what is the bare minimum that somebody needs to do to uh, meet, meet the learning objectives? So this was sort of the bare minimum that I decided on. And this is kind of step one in the process of um, really redesigning the whole course around this pass-fail uh, system. This is also key um, if you have group work, <laughs> to put the group work in the bottom of the barrel category um, because, uh, and I certainly found this useful for this semester because some people might be switching to pass-fail. If you want to pass the class, you have to pass the group project. Um, and that means that even people who are taking the class pass-fail have the same stakes as the people who are not on the group project. So everybody is um, equally invested in the group. Um, so that's kind of a key thing. And I don't think that's specifically mentioned in the book, but um, pretty much the other things are. So, so basically how you read this is, this is sort of the starting level. Okay, these are the minimum uh, requirements. And then if you want a higher grade, these are the things that you need to do. Um, more of these discussion posts, these are basically, um, reading uh, reflections. Um, you know, this is a, a very basic assignment that I, you know, want people to do. Passing more sections of the test as we go along, doing more discussion posts. Um, the other thing is that this discussion post on, only goes up to nine out of 11. So even people who are aiming for an A in the class don't need to do every single uh, discussion post. So that offers even more flexibility. There's a lot of ways that you can go about, um, go about this. And I also know about my students, what, what grades would they plausibly be aiming for? Um, pretty much they all start out aiming for at least an A minus um, and they want an A and, but this, um, the A only assignments are due at the very, very end of class, so they know if they have the possibility of getting an A. Um, so they have to get their test grade before they know if they have that possibility. Um, yeah. And then, you know, this there was a lot more in class expectations and policies, but this was the just a reiteration of the, the Blackboard point. Um, but I think, you know, sort of starting off, if you want to um, think about implementing this, you could start with an assignment rather than the entire course, right? Uh, so that's the idea here with um, sort of going over an assignment. Um, are there questions in the chat or anything? I think I see something. Uh, yes, there is a question in the chat. Um, it is, are the learning outcomes based on Bloom's taxonomy? Uh, yeah, I do. Um, I do do that and I explain Bloom's taxonomy to the students as well. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, I, I, I try to aim for, for application level for, for most of the, um, for most of the high level outcomes, but there are some lower level ones as well. So, yeah. Okay. There are two more questions, Erica. Um, how does class attendance fit into the grade level requirements? And then I'll- Yeah, so class attend, well, 
<clears throat> so in the before times, <laughs> um, class attendance was mandatory uh, for all grades, um, at, but you could use a token if you needed to miss a class. Uh, so that was how that worked. So it was like either you can use a token to miss a class or you can use one to uh, finish assignments. But yeah, that's how that worked. And then the last question in the chat is, how do you manage the tokens? It sounds like it could complicate things to keep track of those. Uh, I just have a uh, column in Blackboard called tokens. And when they use one, I, I update that number. Um, and I put a note in that grade description saying what they use the token for. So it really hasn't been difficult to manage. Great. Um, there's another one, or we can keep going and I can ask it later to you. Um, I'll, I'll take it. Yeah, how is class participation graded? I don't directly grade participation itself. I mean, I ask them to participate, <laughs> uh, but really in terms of the grade, it's that they show up. Um, so yeah, I mean, the, the class is um, 18 students in each section. So I keep it interactive um, and I do a lot of uh, small group activities and things like that to kind of keep them engaged in class. Uh, but I don't, it is technically in the syllabus, I believe, that like if they are not paying attention, it doesn't count as a tense or something, but in reality, I don't really do that. Gotcha. Yeah. Great, thank you. Sure. Uh, okay, so this is the example of the uh, research article analysis assignment. So, you know, these, these kind, I, I use this one because I thought it might be relevant for a number of you know, any kind of upper level course where you want them to read um, research articles. But basically uh, what I do here is I give them a list of journals in the field um, and, you know, if they wanna choose a different journal, that's also fine. They just need to get it approved. Um, and then, you know, here's the, the main event is the rubric, right? So this is basically my checklist for grading this assignment. They need to do all of these things, right? Um, you know, say whether it's quantitative or qualitative, summarize the main findings, findings in their own words, right? Not just use a bunch of quotes they don't understand. Um, and, uh, you know, talk about the methods. This is a methods class, et cetera. So the, the exact points would probably be different for for other classes. I also explain what I mean by an empirical article rather than an essay or something like that. Um, I talk about how to get access to the, the different journals. So this is, you know, pretty, pretty descriptive. It also has links to the, um, to the journals and things like that. But, uh, you know, I do allow for uh, one error in this uh, category um, because otherwise nobody would pass anything. Um, but other than that, the, these are very sort of strict standards. And I also provide for this assignment an example. Uh, so uh, it's an annotated example, right? So it just kind of, uh, and the comments that I get back tend to be, tend to stick to, um, to this example pretty closely, which is a good thing because this is, uh, this is kind of the thing that I want them to do. But, uh, you know, when I say this must be correct, um, you know, this is, this is the kind of mistake that I would have a hard time giving an F for in an outside of a pass-fail system. But um, if they can't identify whether the article is quantitative or qualitative, which happens um, quite a bit, uh, or let's say it is not unusual for it to happen, um, you know, the, that is not a past assignment, right? It says very clearly that that's the case. Um, yeah. And it gives various comments about, you know, sort of using their own words and also not using terms that they don't understand. Um, you know, when do you need to cite something, right? So I talk about that, that's a, that's a really frequent question. You know, 
writing these up is honestly, it's much easier for assignments that you have used before. Um, it's pretty hard to do it the first time around. So that's something to note. Um, in a certain way, this is this kind of approach is not a bad idea for a course redesign. Um, of course, it would be good for a, a new course as well, but um, I think there are some extra challenges to that. Also, sort of the first time around when I um, when I use this system for the first time, um, there were some things that I wish I had included in my rubric that I didn't include the first time. Uh, so, you know, basically there were a couple students who I kind of felt, mm, you know, they should have got a B plus, not an A minus or something like that. Uh, but, you know, this time around, I made some adjustments based on, on what I found the first time around as well. Uh, so, okay, any other questions? Not in the chat. Okay. <clears throat> All right. So let's go on to our rubric workshop. So this just requires that you have something handy. Uh, it could be a multi-level rubric from an assignment or just whatever kind of guidance that you give to students about their work. Um, you want to pull up that information. And what you want to think about to sort of do this activity is what is what is really necessary for students to achieve the learning outcome. Right. So whether you set your level at, you know, a B minus B plus a whatever it happens to be what is really necessary for this. Um, and also, if so, if a student doesn't do the point. Would you be comfortable with uh, failing them for that. Right. Is it that um, makes the grading much easier if you've sort of made that decision um, up front. So how we're going to um, do this is that first we'll um, give you some time to get started and pull things up and then if you know if people don't want to participate in this part that's fine if you don't have something ready um, but also um, once you get started then I'm going to use the breakout room so that you can discuss with a partner. And then we'll have a debrief at the end. That's basically the plan. Questions about this? Okay, so let's go ahead and just pull up what you have to pull up. And I'll give you a couple of minutes to start to have some ideas and then I'll assign the breakout rooms in let's say five minutes.
So to assign the breakout rooms, I need to stop the share. Is that okay with everybody? So if you've not used breakout rooms before, what it is is that you will get a new Zoom with a partner. And so I'll just assign, you know, two or three to a, to a group, and then I'll stop in to the breakout rooms to see how things are going. Um, okay. All right. All right, I'll see you guys in the breakout rooms. Hi, um, how are you? <laughs> good. <clears throat> Lindsay, Jorge. Hey, how are you guys? Good, how are you, Jorge? Very well, good. how are you? <laughs> so I am not a faculty member, but I will uh, join you guys and listen in if you don't mind. <laughs> All right, yeah, you have the expertise. You have a CTRL logo on your left. so that Oh yeah, I'm very good. official. <laughs> I don't have anything handy. Uh, I don't know if you do, Sonia, and we can use your wisdom or we can just talk in general. But, um, I do have an example handy. I work with international students and they have, I work with graduate students. So this is, uh, I don't ever have students taking things pass fail in general. Um, so I don't, you know, I don't feel like I need a specific, uh, uh, just a sec, wait a Um, but I have one uh, that I like where I basically check proficiency. So let me see if I can find it here to share. So I have a, a syllabus that has, let me see here, um, that has this piece here, reflective essay week by week. And this is something that I started doing. My regular grad students don't do this, but my international students do because I want them to have to practice writing. And I, I feel like, and it's, it's about a quarter or a fifth or a quarter of the grade, and I feel like I could make that pass fail just to bring them sort of to a certain level of proficiency. Say, here's what you need, here's how proficient you need to be. These are small constructed responses. They're basically a page, every one of these essays. They're almost on a weekly basis. So I would say they have you know, minus assignment days, etc. They have probably like seven, I think, at this point that I can deploy. I make some of them optional, but really what I should do is have them all seven and then have a pass fail or, and then you need to pass at least five, you know, or something like that. And the explanation is a little further down that I can even pull up. I have a rubric for this. Um, let's see, where do I have reflective essays? Here's the exam. Here's a, the description of my assignment of how they, you know, they need to think about this throughout the course, usually as part of their homework. And it's, it doesn't that learning objectives for these reflective essays are to deepen and fulfill proficiency around concepts, but they don't need to know everything. 
Like I, I'm, I'm happy if they learn, you know, a certain amount of those concepts. It's all about policy process. I mean, whether or not you're into that doesn't matter, but uh, you know, this notion that they have to sort of know that the policy process can change, you know, what the actors are, what the concepts are around the different constraints and opportunities in the policy process. And it really is a, a lot about this enhance your analytic writing proficiency. And it, it, there is a bit of a academic writing portion of my course. I'm not teaching academic writing, but I, I sort of need to with these international students. I wonder if that might lend itself and how I would do it. I think so. I, I'm very skeptical to writing in either way because I think it's, it's so ambiguous, right? Especially when you are doing non quantitative type of teaching. Right? It's, it's different if, you know, you're solving an equation then the answer is minus three. So it's, you, know, <laughs> you either did that or not. But yeah, I can, if you I are can show you a prompt. Well, Maybe that you know, helps. The student completed the assignment and she knows three guns. I can show you an example of how they read, just so you have, uh, let's see, maybe the first Yeah, no, no, one. this is great, but... Uh, yeah, I know what your skepticism is, Somebody I agree, yeah, yeah, yeah. All of that, and, and it could be still not understanding the concept. While some other students might fail, you know, the number of words or something. Yeah. That yeah. You, but you can tell that, you know, the student has a better grasp. So it's always yeah, so a little bit gray, I think. I, I agree. And so maybe, maybe pass fail what you're saying. I mean, you know, cynical or not, but what you're saying is like, let's be careful when it comes to writing and a lot of qualitative work to have this like sort of cut off, you know, something is more or less right, you know, and especially when you have international students, you know, that cuts off sort of very fuzzily because sometimes I have to guess whether they got it right or not just because their language doesn't right. always convey it, you know. Um, and, and so here's one example following your first session, write a short reflective essay about your, a policy that interests you. So they have to understand what a policy is, you know. So I basically check, do they know, you know, I talk at them and I'm pretty fast, you know, I don't make any compromises and see, did they get it? You know, did they understand what I was saying in class, you know? Um, and then, uh, define and describe that policy. You know, it's very sort of what Bloom's taxonomy is kind of more the bottom of that. So it's nothing super complicated. Uh, and then what type of questions? And, and seriously, this is a lot of it is going to be about me knowing if they know what a question is. Like, do they have the ability to formulate a question, you know, with a question mark at the end? Um, and, and so I could see myself checking this off and say they got it, they roughly got what a policy is, they roughly uh, understand what describing something means, and they roughly understand how to formulate a question, because I discussed that in class, what is a, a, a why question, you know, not just like what happened, you know, but why did it happen? Um, so a more, you know, X on Y kind of, you know, relational uh, uh, question, analytic question. So, so I, I can see myself kind of finding, you know, fuzzy as it is, but kind of the cutoff where somebody would get a pass versus a fail. And it would still only be 20% of their overall grade, but it might make my life a little easier, you know, instead of saying, you know, that's where I'm like, I'm looking for efficiency for myself because this takes a lot of time to grade these darn essays and if I could find a way to say here's a bar and you have several of these that you can do even if I get it wrong in a way I'm giving them multiple options to to have a stab at it and even if once in a while I'm not understanding them they have a new they have, a, they have more they can make they can take us you know maybe 10 of these and and probably among the 10 I will start to understand one or the other you know yeah, I guess as long as they don't keep redoing, uh, right, retrying them. That's a good point, yes. Because yes. you have to, yes. you know, rate them 73 times and it's worse than, you know, mm -hmm. through one. That's a really good point. But yeah. That's really, I lose track of that. Numbers right. are, are very, I mean, if, 
you and I were to teach exact same class, yeah. they won't get the same grades, right? The same students, just because, you know, we have different points of view and perceptions and moods and things. So I like the pass grade thing. I'm just nervous about how to draw that line. What do you teach? Uh, right now is a strategy for MBAs. Okay. Uh, and the same thing that, that you mentioned is uh, international ones. No one knows how to write. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes it's like, uh, guys, uh, you, you're going to be read by, you know, sex. Uh, you should be you know, credible in English at least. Yeah. And sometimes I have that conflict. I, uh, there are some students that actually seem to know what they're trying to say. They just don't have the ability to say it right. Yeah. Some others, on the contrary, they can express themselves pretty well, but they don't really know what they're talking about. And, and it's, it's, it's hard sometimes. Well, and, and, you know, setting the bar too high, like I, I used to be more like, well, you've got to get this right, you know, sorry if I have to get it read, etc. Because like you said, execs, uh, you know, in government or in private sector will read this, so you can't afford really mistakes much, although we've become a little more lenient, but it, um, it, it, if you overshoot that and you set the bar so high that they then start copying and using translators and all of that, it's a big mess, you know? Exactly. If you sort of set the bar at the moment where you tolerate the amount of mistakes that they naturally make to allow them to craft it from scratch, you know? And, and if you force them into like using tech help or yeah, translators, uh, and they, they will never learn English, you know? Because they will just write it, I don't know, in Chinese or something, and then plug it into a translator and then whatever comes out, comes out. Yeah, well, that, that, that's <laughs> even worse. Uh, yeah, those <laughs> yes, and I'm like, I, 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 had, I sent something back to one of my students because I had that suspicion. I said, I, I feel you know what you're doing, but what is coming out of the other end sounds like you've plugged it into a translator. And I said, you need to write, start writing from scratch and I will take whatever time it takes to understand you, but there's no way around it because you will never be able to authentically because he seemed smart, like you said, he seemed like he's getting it. But, you know, mm -hmm. unless you, you, you are able to convey, use very simple sentences. I said, she stick to the basic subject, verb, object, and, and just make it super simple. Don't like frill it up with, you know, connections and connectors and, you know, run on sentences and all of that. Just make it really simple for me. You will not be able to convey the, the kind of thinking that you, have with these translators, you know, it's always a mess. It is, yeah. But so, what do you think? Would you dare to do a fail, fail pass class for? Well, the graduate? the thing is, I have um, I teach students in the now. This is all going to go away probably. So I, this I had it has me think on other things here, but. Uh, I teach students in the accelerator program. So you teach them in the MPA, I teach them in the MPA, and they aren't yet matriculated. So I am basically there to determine whether or not they should pass or fail into our program and then matriculate. So I feel super pressured to ex not only give them a grade that's sort of continuous, but give them know exactly where it is that they can matriculate. Um, and, and the temptation is high to say, oh, you know, in doubt, let, let them matriculate, you know. And then we are finding ourselves, and I'm also kind of with that hat of a program director on, I'm finding myself saying, geez, you know, why did we do that? You know, clearly that student should have told, been told right away, this is not going to happen, you know. And, and be very honest about it. But if you're honest about it, you have to have very clear clear criteria. So I, I'm really receptive to that idea of her saying, where's the bar? You know? Yeah, that, that, that to me is the, 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 the trick. And even for the grades, um, is how do you decide, right? If they, they can jump the, the hurdle or not. And, and that's it. That's a, if we were able to, to come up with a reasonable way to do that, I think grades are, can be even 
damaging in both ways, right? Uh, not only, uh, well, I, I just need a C, that's fine. But a lot of A students, I don't know if it's your case, they are A students because that's their job. They want to get A. <laughs> about learning anything. Right? So they, they will, hey, there we go. I have some students, they'll, they'll do whatever it takes to get a grade, but you can tell that they are not really concerned about the content. So uh, to me, A plus students are sometimes suspicious, right? Yeah. After so, everything, or did they really just know how to you know, manage their yeah. professors? And that is more common than, than many of us would like to accept, but, but it happens. So if you take that out, you take the mistake either of, you know, you're only a B minus guy, plus hey, you should know something because you have an A plus, it's just, okay, you, you're certified, right? as, the, as, as Eric has said. And that's all we need to know. And the rest is demonstrated through your actual competence. But I don't know, it's, it's a change. Yeah, Eric, I got us talking about international students because both of us, Jorge and I, are actually working with international students um, and sometimes wondering and, and really kind of receptive to that notion of, you know, where is the bar? At what point, in what ways do we sort of give them check marks, basically saying, even though they all, and I think Jorge has the same, they're all receiving A to F grades, you know, and they don't really have an option with grad students, don't really get an option to do pass fail. Um, but individual assessments might, and I, I, I shared one that I'm doing with them where they write a series of reflective essays, which are meant for me more, and it's a, a fifth of the grades, it's 20%. It's meant to, to check their sort of writing proficiency in a broader sense, academic writing proficiency and to build it. And, and I'm looking, I'm literally being a little selfish here because I'm looking for ways to, to make that easier on me because they do want to redo those assignments. Um, they want another shot at it, and, and why not? Because really what I care about is that they know how to do it at the end. I don't need to, if somebody takes longer, I don't mind, you know, but I need, I need them up there, you know, before right. they matriculate them. Right, yeah, that's, that's kind of how I think about it too. It's like, you know, I, I want you to learn the things, and, and I think this system kind of makes that more clear um, so that the ones who are checking the boxes know, you, you know, you always just have to kind of build it like some, some are going to want to, to game it in some way. Um, but at least we can make sure that the, that the floor is set at a certain level of achievement. Mm -hmm. Um, and that the hurdles to get to the top are really meaningful. Uh, so I don't know. I've I've found like just the quality of the assignment submitted go like <laughs> way up with this uh, with this approach because it, they know that if they're not ready to turn it in, they use a token and they turn it in later, and that's fine, you know. And I don't get that pile of crap that they would have submitted that day, you know, just because they had to. So no, yeah, but it's. Uh, interesting so I think um, it might be just about time to bring the group back together and then we can talk about some experiences and things like that does that seem like it would be okay yeah that sounds good all right I will I'll send a little message to everybody and then um, do that in a minute all right I'll yeah, I was just that. looking up my rubric so one of the questions I would have for you then Erica is kind of figuring out how you turn a rubric that I have, you know, like a All the levels. several in, into a task field. You know, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's just about setting your level of where are you comfortable giving a zero mm -hmm. and, and having them do it again. Because that's what, it, you know, um, if you, it's both high stakes and low stakes at the same time, like you are giving them an F right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and they receive it that way in a certain sense. But um, you're also giving them an opportunity and saying, okay, this is not the acceptable level. So it's, mm -hmm. you know, it's about like, it's probably not that top line of the rubric. There might, there's probably, you know, it's probably some combination of the second and mm -hmm. first levels. Um, 
but what is really the core skill that they need to have um, is really, and, and it takes, it takes a while to figure that out. And I, and the first time around, you're not, you know, you'll, you'll figure out if it's right. So, but especially if it's an assignment that you've done several times before, you know what the main issues are um, and which ones are important and which ones are not. So, yeah, but okay. So I'll get everybody together and we can talk more about this. All right, let's see. All right, see you, see you back beamed. You don't even need to walk anywhere. This is like super lazy. Yeah, I'm not hating it. <laughs> yeah, I think sh I think it'll just Flop shift over. us back know, over. Yeah, know, it's I nice. Know. I have to start using these breakout rooms. It's really neat. Oh, okay. that was a message. Okay, so those of us who remain, um, I think we can just kind of have a informal discussion, any remaining issues or um, things that you found as you actually started to go through an assignment. Maybe start by saying that where I left off, not sort of knowing how to sort of proceed further on, like I, I feel like I can think my way through what it is to be passing, what it is to actually transfer that rubric, you know. Yeah, it, it's, a, it's a difficult decision for each one. At least you're starting with a rubric that's, um, you know, not everybody uh, uses those, but um, it's really, it's a combination of, you know, gut feeling of like would i be because what you what it needs to be is something that you're willing to use um if it's the case where you're not comfortable failing people because they didn't meet this exact point it shouldn't be on there right so it's at a certain level it's it's that because you need to be willing to to use it and and that each item on there is serious enough that they need to rewrite it to pass your class, right? Because in a certain way, it ups the stakes for small assignments um, if they are on that list of required assignments for for you know low for low grades, right? Um, so you know, if they make you know fifteen spelling mistakes, I'm comfortable with that. You know, but you but you know you might not be depending on your students or the classes that you teach or something like that. So, how about book? We're talking about that. It seems like it could be more efficient from the grading perspective since you just say, okay, this is a zero, submit it again. But I can see the you know, the scenario where somebody is just submitting something 73 times because, you know, they keep not getting it. And that could be more taxing, right? What's your experience there? Is it something that they really try to catch up or they just keep, you know, sending stuff? Um, I really haven't had that problem. And, and part of that is the token system. So, um, and it's also, I also make it so that you can resubmit it once. Okay, um, so it's not indefinite. It's not indefinite. I, I, yeah, you didn't, yeah, you didn't want somebody to send me Yeah, something. Yeah, I mean, in practice, actually, like I was saying this in one of, one of the other groups, but um, if they fail something that they need to pass to pass the class, like, and, and they, I've never had the case where they resubmitted it and it didn't pass, but if that theoretically did happen, I'd probably give them another chance because it would be very disappointing for them to fail the class in the third week of class or something, but uh, yeah. 
Okay. I also um, wondered whether, so I have a, a, a minor, minor, not really minor, but a, a part of an assign of, of my assessment that could be turned into pass fail for my own benefit and maybe theirs because sort of at the margin, it doesn't matter. It really matters whether they pass or fail that small, it's short essays. Instead of redoing, which I find difficult to handle on my end because I have to constantly go back and see what they read it uh, in, in, in Blackboard, for example. Um, what about just giving them you have to pass seven out of 10? Yes, know? yeah. Um, so it's a redo, not of the same assignment, but rather of, of sort of a minimum amount of, of getting this. Um, over, yeah, over the that's, that's really similar to how I do those um, discussion posts. And those are just, you know, reading reflections, like, you know, tell me the main points of all the readings for this week. And so um, they, to pass the class, they have to do seven of the 11 of them, but to get an A, they have to do nine of the 11. Mm. And by do, and not do, but pass, right? So um, especially early on in the semester, that's a way that I give them feedback about that they have to follow all the directions because I, f I will fail them for any minor thing because they have many opportunities throughout the semester to, um, to deal with that. And I don't have to re, they don't have to resubmit it necessarily. Um, now they can, but I usually, I've had students ask like, oh, do I need to use a token to redo my discussion post? I'm like, not unless you've already failed two of them. <laughs> Right, so I don't get a lot of redos of those. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah, that sounds. Uh, I don't know if you've seen the EDX site. Um, that's uh, like the crossing of Coursera. Uh, mm -hmm. Way they, they they give you typically a pass fail thing, and I only taken quantitative things, so they are mostly graded automatically. But the idea is that you have a um, like a dashboard, and you can see for each assignment, you know, if it passes the the threshold or not. So you know uh, if you're you know, getting ready to pass or if you have to you know, really worry about your next assignments. So that way, you know, by you know, have the term you might know. You know, I already passed. I have all the the requirements and then just you know, continue at my leisure or I am in trouble, I need to really improve my performance. But I think it's, it's nice because it gives you, it's very clear both for the grader and the person taking the class, where are you in terms of your total decision, let's say, if it's not a grade. Yeah, um, exactly. And also, you know, um, if somebody is, let's say they're taking the class pass fail or they just want to pass the class or something, you know, other than the group project, they really don't have to do anything like the last few weeks of the class. Um, and they can concentrate on their other classes or whatever. So, um, you know, as long as they've met the minimum bar for the things that they have to do, that's fine. You know, they, they can manage their workload a little bit better with, with that knowledge, I think. Erica. Do you find that this takes the focus um, from the student perspective um, off the what do I need to do to get an A? Yes. And does it focus, shift that focus more to the learning? I think so. I, I, they know exactly what they need to know, that what, what it takes to get the grade that they want to get. I don't get that question. And if I do, I just say, here's the, <laughs> you know, here's exactly what you need to do. Um, so it shifts that energy towards actually learning the material, I hope. Um, and it really takes a lot of stress off of them because there are really, you know, even if they don't say it, there's a lot of students too, that's really all they want to know. <laughs> and they spend a lot of time trying to figure that out. And if you just tell them, it really takes, uh, it helps them out. <laughs> Thing. But and this question is, you know, regardless of if it's a fail pass or just a grade, I'm curious about what we we're saying. Uh, are they learning anything or are they just, you know, check marking things to get the grade? Uh, so when, when you're doing quantitative type of, of work, it's like, okay, so you need to know how to make 
to do regression analysis. It's very simple, right? You give them data, they come back with regression. So you can tell kind of objectively that they know how to use the software. Then you can ask, right? So what does that mean that, you know, that coefficient is negative or that the F is less than, so if they answer something, you say, well, they must know what they're, or they don't. But if you ask them, well, what's your opinion about current, the current management of, you know, the administration, right? There's so many things they can say that it's hard to know if they really know anything or they're just sort of paraphrasing something. You know, it, the, the, the further away you go from quantitative stuff, it becomes really tricky. Say, well, they have an assignment, doesn't have, you know, spelling mistakes. Uh, it looks nice. I know they're not saying anything, but somehow, you know, complies with every, with, you know, with every check mark. So it yeah, looks, I mean, you, that's, that's why it's just like, it just takes a lot of thought about what those, those actual rubric points should be. Um, so, you know, do they have a um, coherent perspective about what is good and bad about the methodology of this paper, right? That's something that is a little bit more squishy, but like, I feel comfortable saying yes or no about that based on what they write about the methods. Do they, you know, are they demonstrating an understanding of this? So, you know, it's, it's really about, you know, there's gonna be students, and that's really what this is designed for is students who check the boxes. And then what I feel like my job is in, in designing the boxes is making sure that those boxes are really meaningful learning. Um, and that's, that's the hard part of it, right? Um, and the first time around, it's hard, but the second time around, it's a lot easier. Um, you know, I, I felt like the first time I did it, there were some cases where I like, oh, they really don't get this, but like they checked all the boxes. Then the second time around, I do better boxes. You know, so that's kind of, kind of how I did it. But you know, when you were talking about those questions, you know, this was a big thing in, in how I do, do the test. So that's a whole another topic that you know, we have a few minutes I can get into a little bit about the tests. Um, Cause those, those took me the longest to figure out how to do in a pass fail way. Um, so a while ago, I sort of decided to do the tests as um, short answers rather than uh, multiple choice or, or long essays. Um, Cause I had a hard time failing long essays because it was just too, many things at once but with the short answers if this is a bunch of bs like it's pretty easy to say no <laughs> this is not so that's kind of what worked for me and so you know what i did for the test is i organized it into sections of like basically bodies of knowledge or topics from from the class like okay do you know anything about sampling you know <laughs> you have to get four out of five of these short answer questions correct and then you kind of pass like the sampling section right and then do you know anything about um you know uh, measurement how to do measurement okay if you get or, or you know do you know what an experiment is this is like a very uh <laughs> um a lot of times the answer is no but um the you know and I'm going to ask you five questions. If you get four of them right, I'm going to say, yes, you've passed this kind of body of knowledge, right? And then mapping that back to, okay, how many bodies of knowledge do you have to pass to pass the class with a certain grade? And that, that was, that's actually kind of the backbone of the system that I lined out there because those questions are, to me, like, you know, if they don't know, there, there, are, there are answers to those. They're not easy to look up online. <laughs> um, I, I let them, I give them, when we do it in person, a note card so they can write down definitions. I don't care that they know the definition. I care that they know the idea. And uh, basically, if they can't give coherent answers in that format, and then I also, like, if they don't pass a section, I give them another try. So I, 
have like two tests basically, um, but it's, you know, five, 25 questions. Um, so it's not too overwhelming, but um, that's kind of how I organized it so that I know that um, if you get an A, you have gotten four out of the five short answer questions in every section correct. So I feel comfortable that like, if you <laughs> are talking to somebody about research, that I'm not going to be embarrassed that you got an A in my class. <laughs> That's basically, you know, kind of one of the ways that I think about it. Yeah, that's that's definitely a good way to, to do it. All right. No, thanks a lot. That it's been very helpful. Sure. Any other questions? Okay, well, free, feel free to get in touch and um, yeah, thanks everybody for, for sharing and uh, looks like we made some connections among our group, so that's good. And uh, I will see, maybe see you around someday when we are able to see people again. <laughs> Thank you, Erica, it was Thank very you. helpful, it was good. Thanks, Thank you. Great.